So UK Biobank is very much more than a biobank. You've heard about its great size, so we have a, a very large number of participants. You've heard about the breadth and depth of the data that's been collected about those participants. Um, so they're extremely well phenotyped and becoming more so as time goes by. And they're also all being genotyped. We have as well, of course, the fabulous sample collection that you've heard about and um, a number of assays, uh, quite apart from the genotyping going on, uh, on all of those. But what makes UK, Bi UK Biobank really special as time goes by is that it's a prospective study and that we're going to learn through following up these individuals a great deal about their health outcomes during the future. And it's through studying those health outcomes, the diseases that people have or the good long, long health that they have, the disability that they may develop as a result of disease, the issues around quality of life and the things from which they die, um, that you, the research community, will be able to conduct studies of what it is that causes some people to develop those diseases and others to be protected against those. And it's only through following up all these half million participants that we can actually really make UK Biobank into a truly prospective resource. So here are some numbers for you. You've heard about how and why it's so important to study a very large number of individuals and to recruit so many people into the study to generate large numbers with any particular disease or health outcome of interest. These are the numbers of people with conditions by self-report um, confirmed at verbal interview by a research nurse. Um, at the baseline visit. So these are prevalent conditions at baseline. And it gives you a feel, these are just a few examples of some of the um, uh, conditions that generate largest numbers, but there are many, many, many uh, data besides these available, and you can look at them in the data showcase. But it gives you an idea of the sort of uh, numbers of conditions, at least at baseline. Um, so you can see the cardiometabolic conditions um, having the kind of importance quantitatively that you would imagine they would, the cancers, and a number of other conditions as well, arthritic conditions, and so on. As if not, of course, more important are the incident outcomes that will occur during follow-up, because that's really why we are um, doing a prospective study like this. So these are the numbers that we expect to occur on the basis of a conservative modeling exercise during the course of follow-up. Um, and I should say, when we compared the models that were designed to predict approximate numbers of prevalent conditions um, that we've picked up by self-report at baseline, with what we predicted, we were pretty much spot on for most of those conditions. So uh, one would hope that we're not too far off in terms of these projections of incident outcomes. And you can see as time goes by that the wealth of data within the resource for supporting particular types of study will increase, particularly early on for cardiovascular and cancer outcomes. But as time goes by, particularly for other types of outcomes, some rarer diseases will become easier to, to study as time goes by as well. And perhaps the neurodegenerative conditions represent one of the most um, exciting potential uses of UK Biobank, um, and particularly projecting into the future. You can see that um, conditions such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's become increasingly common and generate larger numbers of cases for doing investigative studies. So following up half a million people isn't trivial. I'm a neurologist as well as an epidemiologist, and um, I don't think this is the sort of thing that can be done in my Monday afternoon clinic, that's for sure. Um, and actually, even if everyone in this room did a few clinics a week, we still couldn't possibly do it. This is not the sort of thing at this scale that can be done through face-to-face -face methods or even through many of the methods that might traditionally be used in smaller-sized follow-up studies. We need methods for following up these people that are comprehensive, that are scalable, and that are affordable. They must be cost effective. And they need to cover a whole range of different outcomes because UK Biobank is not a study designed to look at one particular condition. It's there for the use of the whole research community and we need to make sure that we cover um, comprehensively the health outcomes that, uh, that could justifiably be studied using such a resource. So luckily, 
we are in the UK. All the participants in UK Biobank are registered with a GP in the NHS, or at least they were when they were recruited, and most of them still will be. And all of them have consented at their baseline visit to linkage to all health-related records for the purposes of their follow-up. The NHS still, at least after a fashion, provides the majority of healthcare in the UK. And there are national data sets about healthcare and health outcomes. And so it ought to be reasonably straightforward to link to these data sets and gain a huge wealth of information about what is happening to our participants as we follow them up over the years. I wish it were as simple as it sounds. Uh, it's not quite as straightforward as it sounds, but we do have the possibility of creating data linkages that are very informative. One of the challenges that we have, but also one of the advantages, is that the half million participants in UK Biobank were recruited, as you've seen earlier today, from centres around the UK and uh, from England and Scotland and Wales. And um, although the vast majority of them were recruited in England, substantial numbers were recruited in other countries. It's important, though, in considering uh, the data linkages and the follow-up methods to think about the fact that these three countries have somewhat different methods for providing data and for linking to data and provide data sets using somewhat uh, different regulatory procedures and different matching procedures and so on. Um, and that anything that's not available for England is unlikely to be an immediately useful way of following up our cohort uh, in a cohort-wide fashion, although there may be lessons to be learned from Scotland and Wales who have, uh, in, in some senses, richer data sets to offer um, in terms of learning what additional value they might have or testing the validity of the data sets that are available more widely in England. And England is catching up fast, I can tell you. So our strategy for follow-up is mainly to focus on data linkage because it will give us, we think, the biggest wins and the fastest for the research community. Um, and we focused over the last few years on establishing uh, linkages to key electronic coded national sources that can feasibly be generated for all our participants. Now, the easiest of those and the longest established are death registration and cancer registration systems, which have been going for many years and have already been used in large-scale cohort research studies. Um, and we also um, are establishing and have indeed established linkages to hospital episode data from all three countries. So that gives us coded information on admissions to hospital and also some information on outpatient consultations as well. The holy grail of data linkages, or one of them anyway, is to link nationally to primary care data. There still isn't a single national solution for primary care data that gives coverage of all the practices um, across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and we've worked with a number of different data providers to try and help and encourage them to develop a solution that will work for research studies. We think we're getting there um, and we encourage you to help us in that endeavour. And more of that later. There are some... Uh, Challenges in data linkage, uh, several of which I knew about before I entered uh, my journey with UK Biobank and some of which um, I've become aware of along the way of the last few years. So I think the, the major challenge still remains around regulation, bureaucracy and permissions. There are lots of well-intentioned people in the data linkage field. Uh, all the data providers have a different series of regulations and uh, bureaucratic steps that one has to go through. Um, and any attempts made <coughs> by um, powerful individuals to bring these um, areas of regulation, bureaucracy and permissions together under one roof, I think, are um, to be uh, encouraged and welcomed because it would make uh, life a lot easier for those of us trying to generate linkages to what seem to be fairly simple uh, data sets with the consent of our participants. There are challenges of data transfer as well. So getting data from NHS systems into university systems or systems outside of the NHS, even when covered with the strongest of ethical um, and information governance principles can be challenging both technically and from an information governance perspective. 
There are some interesting uh, challenges to do with matching. So when one links to other data sets, obviously it's important to match participants based on a number of different identifiers. Each data provider tends to run its own bespoke matching algorithm, and it generates some interesting curiosity. So we have a few people um, in our death returns who died in Scotland prior to their date of participation um, and recruitment into the study which presumably has got something to do with the nature of the matching algorithm. Now, luckily, these um, quirks are running at a very, very low level, and uh, we're investigating them. And they wouldn't, in any sense, um, uh, change the results of a large-scale study. But it's important for us to understand where they come from and to be able to explain them. We come across problems with the returning of codes. As you might imagine, the NHS is a huge organization, and the data has to come through the hands of clinicians and data coding clerks into large data repositories, and then is linked and served up towards uh, various studies. And um, little gremlins can creep in along the way, uh, at any point along the way in the process. And trying to understand where they occur um, can be helpful. Not necessarily that we should try to influence them, but just understanding uh, what the data might or might not be telling us is very important. Mapping between coding systems is challenging as well. So uh, one uh, fairly straightforward example, as it happens, is that um, the international coding uh, classification of diseases updates itself every so often. Um, so uh, there's been a change from ICD-9 to ICD-10, and there will soon be a further change from ICD-10 to ICD-11. These newer versions are generally better. Uh, but we still have to account for the fact that many of the health outcomes that we collect will be coded using previous versions, and the mapping between these different versions is not trivial. Um, and it's not something that we want to impose on researchers to do for themselves unless it's absolutely necessary to do that. Understanding the structure of the data is challenging as well. Hospital episodes data uh, from England has something like 300 or more data fields within it. Most of those data fields are administrative and of limited interest to researchers, but some of them will be important. And if we don't know what they are and how to interpret them, then we will never know. So we, it's very important for us to understand those. And as I alluded to earlier, the different countries make somewhat different retur returns to us. So hospital episodes data um, from Scotland and from Wales and from England do not all look identical in terms of their data structure and formatting. They're pretty similar, but they're not identical, and we have to deal with that centrally and try and convert into a, as common a format as possible. And then presenting these complex data to researchers through the data showcase um, is a further challenge that we have um, encountered. And in moving from hospital episode data to deal with primary care data, we anticipate the challenges will be an order of magnitude larger. But we have made substantial progress. So we're now operating at the kind of state-of-the-art level for large cohort studies. Um, we've pulled in data on certified deaths by cause and registered cancers, which are coded um, according to the International Classification of Diseases, from all three countries in which we have participants. And we, our, our whole cohort is flagged um, in England, Scotland, and Wales, so that we receive quarterly returns of registered cancers and deaths and can update our database and make these data available um, for researchers and update the database for researchers every, every six months or so. So there is something like about 70,000 or more registered cancers available within the UK Biobank data set um, and over 7,000 deaths by cause and that's probably a number which is now outdated as the data set are about, is about to be updated again. We've also now pulled in the hospital episodes data, both retrospectively and prospectively, um, up to 2011 or so for the three uh, countries where we have participants. Um, and those data as well are now available for researchers to access. So within the next few weeks, our data set will be updated to pull in the data not just from England, which are there already, but to pull in the data from Scotland and Wales as well, and all the retrospective data going back as far as it goes. Um, in the case of Scotland, that's back into the 1980s. So primary care does remain a challenge. We have systems... Um, that were to some extent developed specifically for um, UK Biobank that have operated in Scotland and in Wales, somewhat different systems in both of those countries, to pull together data from general practices where there are UK Biobank participants and to make those data available um, 
for um, incorporation into the UK Biobank data set. Um, we, we've reached up to about half of all the participants in Wales and Scotland being linked to their primary care records. But we do need and want to do very much better. We still have a challenge in England, and we're starting to work directly with the GP system suppliers, who are fewer and fewer in number and dominate more and more general practices as a potential solution to accessing these data. Many of you will know that there are also some national uh, systems for linking to primary care data, which work very well if you don't want to link across the whole country to a specific cohort, as UK Biobank does. So, for example, the clinical practice um, data link uh, is one such resource, which is very useful, but covers only about 10% of UK general practices at the moment, although the coverage is increasing. Uh, so, for our purposes at present, it's not ideal. There are a huge number of data sets we could link to, which could be extremely informative. And, in fact, uh, probably just about everyone in this room could name a data set that it would be really great uh, for us to link to. Um, so in thinking about what data sets we link to, we have to think about what scientific value they will add to the death, cancer, hospital episodes and primary care data that we hope to have across the whole data, uh, across the whole cohort and that we do already have uh, the first three, four. What will they add? How much effort and cost will it be to get them? Um, so we're thinking about the incremental value. But I think here we really do turn to the scientific community and its knowledge of what data sets are out there, what their meaning is, what they add. Do they add administrative data or do they add data of genuine diagnostic value in terms of deciding um, who has developed a particular disease or not? And do they add other interesting um, aspects that maybe uh, we haven't yet thought about? So some of the data sets we are linking to are tracing systems that allow us to keep uh, in touch with where our participants are. It's very important for us to know where they are around the country, which general practice they're registered with when they move, and what their new uh, postal address is when they move as well. We have email addresses on about two-thirds of our participants, but postal addresses remain extremely important for many types of recontact that we want to be able to facilitate. We're um, linking to an enhanced cancer data set. So those of you who are cancer researchers um, will be aware of the fantastic work done by the National Cancer Intelligence Network and the data held in the National Cancer Data Repository, which is a much richer data set than can be obtained from the Office for National Statistics Cancer Registries. So when we obtain these additional data, and a great deal of work has been done both to make them available and to decide what data would be of most value, we'll be able to provide information on tumor stage, grade, and other aspects of tumor pathology that are not available routinely across the whole country um, in the cancer registries. And we will have that data first for England, so for the vast majority of participants, and then hopefully um, rolling out into Scotland and Wales. We hope in the future to link to cancer screening data sets. These data sets uh, require quite a lot of work to uh, make them really usable for research. And a lot of that work is being done by the Million Women's Study researchers at the moment. And uh, so we are in waiting mode, waiting for uh, the, the background work to be done to enable us to more readily link to cancer screening data and make those available as well. There are some data sets that the um, Health and Social Care Information Centre based in Leeds and Southport are going to be making it available very soon for relatively small sums of money. And those include some interesting men mental health minimum data sets, which pre provide some diagnostic information about contacts outside of hospital in the community. Um, and diagnostic imaging requests data set, which is not scans and it's not imaging reports, but it's a good start at least to know who has had what kinds of radiology procedures done. It gives us a handle on what might be going on. There are potential non-cancer screening data sets. Um, perhaps a good example would be screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms, and a very enthusiastic group are um, uh, going to work with us to help produce linkages to those data in the future. We've had conversations with John Galloway and colleagues about linkages to dental records, which would not be particularly well covered with our existing linkages. Um, and there are a whole host of disease registries around the place, some of which have great longevity and great richness. Others come and go. 
There are quite a lot of disease audits, some of which pull together some of the data we're already linking to. Um, and so there may be good cases for linking to some of those in particular circumstances where they're really going to yield additional value. There are, of course, dispensing data, um, other richer radiology and laboratory reporting systems, which may become available in the coming years for large uh, components of the population in UK Biobank. And then there are health-related but not direct health data from other government departments. And other cohort studies have done a great deal of work um, with some of these government departments. Um, the ASPAC cohort um, in the southwest is a good example. And these could produce data of great interest to social science and other researchers. So moving from linked data to adjudicating health outcomes, what do the coded data actually tell us? How accurate are they? How detailed are they? How complete are they? And for any particular disease outcome of interest, in what circumstances do we need to go beyond the coded data? For anyone who's interested in any particular disease, it's probably always, but um, obviously one has to take a strategic view and prioritize, um, and then use the input from the research community to enhance our methods appropriately. And we have indeed had very helpful um, expert advice from members of our outcomes working group on the types of methods uh, we might use to ascertain, confirm, and subclassify a whole range of disease outcomes. And we've concentrated our discussions around outcomes <clears throat> in areas that are likely to generate uh, health outcomes that are the largest in quantity um, over the first 10, 15 years or so um, of follow-up. Uh, but clearly, this process could be extended to a whole range of other outcomes, rarer diseases as well. Um, so we've had uh, subgroups working on cancer diabetes, cardiac outcomes, and stroke in particular um, over the last uh, few years. And then groups also starting to think about mental health outcomes, ocular outcomes, neurodegenerative diseases, respiratory outcomes, and musculoskeletal disease. Perhaps um, I don't need to persuade you of the value of accurate and detailed phenotyping of health outcomes, but I think there are two particular reasons for this. One is that it enhances the power of any particular study, really through avoiding noise in the data, or what we call misclassification. And the key point about misclassification is to avoid false positives in any case control comparison. The, uh, the group of people within a resource such as UK Biobank who develop a disease are likely to be relatively small in number, of the order of thousands for the uh, uh, diseases that I showed you. And <clears throat> having even just a fairly small number of individuals who don't have the disease contaminating, if you like, that case group could have an effect on study power. A similar number of individuals in the very much larger um, control population who have the disease, and if you like, contaminate the control population is much less of an issue. So avoiding false positives is a key priority. Increased specificity of disease classification is also um, very important because the determinants of disease groups that seem to be similar but actually are likely or known to be etiologically different um, can be very important. And an example from my own field of stroke uh, might be that in the genetic studies of stroke, uh, genetic variants that are associated with stroke have only so far been identified, not, uh, not with ischemic stroke, but with particular subtypes of ischemic stroke. And the same seems likely to hold true for subtypes of hemorrhagic stroke as well. Another example would be that those of you who are interested in breast cancer would, be, would want to know, I imagine for many studies, the estrogen receptor status of those cancers. So specificity of disease classification um, across the whole range of diseases um, may be very important for particular types of studies. It won't be important for all types of studies, but for some. So we have put together, um, with the help of the Outcomes Working Group, chaired by John Danish, um, who's in the audience today, a number of general principles for our outcomes adjudication strategy. First of all, we've adopted a staged approach to thinking about this, thinking about methods to ascertain cases of disease, methods to confirm caseness of disease, and methods for their subclassification where appropriate, or subphenotyping, if you like. 
As I've alluded to, we felt that it's most important to avoid false positive cases and tolerating some false negatives is okay. Indeed, we may need to tolerate some false positives, but at least we want to have an idea of, of, of what the positive predictive value of our case ascertainment procedures are. We do need procedures that are geographically generalizable throughout all of the areas where we have participants. We need procedures which are scalable. Those are likely to require support by centralized um, development of IT and other systems. And we need uh, methods that are cost-effective and future-proof. Clearly, data linkage is a key step on this pathway. But going beyond that, we still need to think about scalability, cost-effectiveness, and so on. And in terms of future-proofing, having a disease definition that is very tightly locked to one period of time could be problematic. We need to have ways of defining disease that are flexible and can be updated if required in the future. Um, of course, if, as many of you know, diseases have a habit of changing their definitions every few years. So um, here's an illustration of that strategy. <clears throat> Ascertainment of suspected cases uh, needs to occur across the whole cohort, and so in a very large number of individuals, um, and need, needs methods which are highly cost-effective and feasible and geographically generalizable. And we're thinking here about things like our data linkages to death registers, cancer registers, hospital episodes, and so on. To confirm that an individual does or doesn't have a case, we, we still need, um, or doesn't have a case of a particular disease, we still need methods that are scalable, but they can be somewhat more costly because they're likely to be applied to a group of suspected cases rather than to the whole cohort. And that's where we might find linkages to disease registers helpful or cross-referencing of particular um, health record sources. And then for subclassification of cases, in some circumstances, it may well be appropriate to go into more involved and costly territory um, and this is where linkages to things like tumor histopathology specimens might be particularly helpful for adjudication of cancers, and uh, indeed we are piloting those methods. It's where linkages to a retrieval of specialized information, such as brain scans for neurological disorders like stroke, or a view of clinical records where the clinical narrative is particularly important, and that might well be the case for some neurodegenerative disorders. And for those more costly measures, we need to restrict our efforts to people who we know already have or are highly likely to have a particular disease. So practically speaking, how do we implement all of this? It's a huge body of work, potentially. And we need to move from linked data to research-ready outcomes. And what we've uh, put in place uh, is the concept of a phased implementation. So we have, over the last few years, been doing a great deal of planning, which within the outcomes working group has involved scoping, holding meetings with the scientific community, conducting literature reviews to find out what particular types of coded data actually tell us how accurate they are, and doing some small-scale pilot work. And this planning phase is pretty advanced for four disease areas, cancer, cardiac disease, stroke, and diabetes, and is underway for other areas. We're now moving into and um, have started to develop algorithms based on the state-of-the-art coded data that we already have. So combining information from the death, cancer, and hospital episode data sets to generate algorithms which maximize the positive predictive value for particular types of disease and define prevalent and incident cases of disease so that Hopefully, within the coming months, as researchers apply more and more to use the UK Biobank resource, we'll be in a position to serve you up with more research-ready data than the somewhat messier linked data that currently are accessible to the um, brave uh, amongst you. As we move into phase two, then we'll be pulling in additional coded data. And um, during the course of the coming months and into next year, uh, we very much hope to significantly increase the amount of primary care data we have, incorporating that into our algorithms, along with additional data from the enhanced, data, from the enhanced cancer data set and from some disease registers. And a good example would be the MINAP, Myocardial Infarction National Audit Project, um, we'll be able to generate more complex algorithms so that we can refine the definitions of prevalent and instant disease cases. And we'd be very interested to have input from researchers into this process. Any intelligence you have about sources of data that are easy to get hold of and that are highly informative 
um, we are really, really very keen to hear from you. And any information you have on the performance of these types of data sets against a decent reference standard so that we don't have to pilot absolutely everything would also be really of great value to us. And then phase three, another holy grail, if you like, um, is to move into a phase for some particular disorders largely to be driven, I think, by the research community of expert adjudication, which will focus on confirmation and subclassification of disease. And we've envisaged for this that we would incorporate non-coded data from local sources, medical records, imaging, and so on. Um, there will, in the future, be much higher tech uh, bioinformatics driven solutions to this and the FAR Institute will do a lot of work to help us in this endeavor. But in the meantime, we will probably work with the clinical research network to gather these data locally around the country and to incorporate them into an interactive web adjudication platform for complex and detailed adjudication. So as we move forward through the phases, different types of study will be possible. But already using state-of-the-art coded data, studies such as the Million Women Study have been able to address questions such as the influence of body mass index on large numbers of cardiovascular outcomes and the determinants of motor neuron disease. So working with what we have now and aspiring to better and more detailed adjudication in the future is what it's all about. Thank you. Questions from the uh, from the audience. Yes, there's just one here. Could you just wait for the microphone, uh, please? And, and remember to say your your name. Uh, I'm Carnio from uh, Imperial. I was wondering whether um, you could tell us a bit more about the um, inconsistencies that you would have between the different data set. Was it very often in which data set did it, you know, concern? And also whether this algorithm that you were mentioning uh, would be made available for researcher. Um, so the answer to the second question is very easy, it's yes. I mean, in fact, we will probably, once they've been generated and tested, run some of the simpler algorithms on the data set so that researchers can choose to have, uh, if you like, pre-prepared data with cases defined according to a particular recipe, or they can go it alone if they have their own particular algorithm they want to run. Um, in terms of um, uh, inconsistencies between the data sets, it's a very disease-specific uh, question, I think, and it depends on what, what, what disease you're referring to. So um, uh, if you look at, for example, work done by Harry Hemingway's group, um, I'm not sure if Harry's here, but uh, he heads up one of the FAR Institute uh, sub-centers in London, and they've done a lot of work on cardiovascular outcomes, looking at cross-referencing different sources of data. And they've shown um, discrepancies in um, the cases of myocardial infarction, for example, that can be retrieved from death registers, from hospital episode data, from primary care, and through self-report. But in a sense, those discrepancies are hardly surprising. So one would have confidence that a case was a case where they all were overlapping, but you wouldn't necessarily want to disregard uh, the cases which were only in primary care records, for example, because they may represent the cases that are not admitted to hospital. So being able to go one step beyond that and have a comparison with a reference standard to say for each data set what its performance is and then what the cross-referencing uh, means uh, more, more completely will be very useful. And that's the kind of work that our outcomes adjudication subgroups have been thinking about and taking on, but, but with a very disease-specific approach. So I think the answer is disease-specific as well. Cathy, can I just ask one question? We heard this morning about the, uh, the uh, pilot looking at acquisition of tumour samples. Can you describe how, how that kind of work fits into this, uh, this overall approach? Yeah, so um, I, I guess the cancer research is in the room. I mean, no one's ever satisfied with what they get, are they? So you can always do better. But the cancer researchers in the room are in a very privileged position because we have fabulous cancer registries. They've been relatively easy to um, link to. And already there are very rich cancer data within the resource that I would encourage you to start using straight away. But also, um, you have uh, the National Cancer Intelligence Network and the Nas National Cancer Data Repository, and we work with Rachel Brannan and Katerini Blaveri here in the audience and Henrik Muller and others to make the fullest use of that resource as we possibly can, and that's where our enhanced data set is coming from. 
But for cancer researchers, I think your holy grail is access to tissue, the cancer tissue itself. And we're trying to make that a reality. We're not yet exactly sure how best to make it a reality. And that's why we're piloting um, in Newcastle with Andy Hall. Uh, so what we're piloting is how we will, if, how easily we can link to hospital pathology record systems. Can we, from people who we know in our cohort, have uh, cancer and have had it, um, have had care for their cancer provided by a major centre where there are reasonably large numbers of cases? Can we identify their records? Um, by linking to histopathology record systems in one particular large centre, and can we retrieve the samples? Can we work with pathologists to make that a workable system? And what kind of information do pathologists need to make them feel comfortable with providing us with information? And there's two potential solutions, I think, that have been mooted. One is to generate a catalogue of where there are tumour specimens around the country that link to UK Biobank participants. And then for the research community to access that catalogue and to retrieve the tumour samples through UK Biobank. Um, and as we do that, we might actually pull tumour samples into a real library of tumour samples and build that resource as we go. And the other is to actually access bits of tumours from all around the country. And that's probably a more difficult and less obvious route to go because it's better if it's driven by the research community. But through the pilot, we'll be able to um, work out what route is likely to work best and what is likely to be most cost effective. Thanks, Cathy. Any more questions before we uh, go to the roundtable discussion? Okay, we're going to take a, a quite a slight break from the presentations now, and I'll ask uh, Rory and Cathy to, to stay on the stage to be joined by uh, Professor John Dinesh from the University of Cambridge and uh, Professor Ronan Lyons from the University of Swansea um, for, a, for a panel discussion, a broader discussion on this uh, topic. So I'd encourage you really to uh, ask questions as broadly as you like. Um, who would like to start? I mean, one thing I might kick off with, um, yes, would you mind Tim, it? is uh, you, we're, we're looking for what we haven't done from the audience as well. Um, you know, what else could be done uh, in terms of phenotyping the disease? Because uh, um, typically in prospective studies, there's a lot of focus on phenotyping the participants. Um, and a criticism of, of them often is that the, the disease outcomes are not phenotyped well enough. Uh, the working group that John has headed up um, with a lot of people from a lot of different areas have, have thought of, of lo lots of ways of, of doing that. Um, and we've also been thinking about lots of ways in which to follow up particular diseases. But you know, we're, we're also aware of the limitations, and particularly the limitations of linkage um, uh, for those disease outcomes that um, aren't diagnosed well. Um, and so we will be touching on that a bit later when John Gallagher talks about the use of, of web questionnaires and other kinds of questionnaire approaches to um, identifying diseases that aren't diagnosed. Um, so can we detect a cognitive decline um, during follow-up um, or mental health uh, conditions that haven't been diagnosed through questionnaire-based approaches? Um, uh, and I think we're, we're, we're certainly you know, looking for ideas from people about what are the disease outcomes that may not be picked up from linkage that we should be using these questionnaire approaches for quality of life, um, disability, and things like that. Uh, so, questions? While, while people are thinking, obviously, after their lunch, um, I'd start with a question. Cathy, what, what information do you think that we'll get from the, the primary care data that will be informative? And what, what are the challenges there around uh, adjudication, both in terms of the, of the, the outcomes themselves?